Welcome back to Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan and very excited to bring this episode to you where we're going to be speaking to one of the great names of British Speedway of the 80s and the 90s. Jeremy Doncaster spent most of his career riding for Ipswich Witches, but was also part of that great Reading team of the early 90s, particularly the 1992 season. Jeremy was also part of the Great Britain team that won the World Team Cup in 1989 at Bradford. He was the top scorer for Great Britain on that day with 13 points. But the meeting was marred by the crash that led to the life-changing injuries received to Eric Gunderson. We'll speak about that meeting and the rest of his career, including his appearances in world finals. He reached three in total and uh, particularly in Munich, had a runoff for second place with his great friend Simon Wigg. We'll also hear about his Czech golden helmet times, uh, adventures across Europe in the days when travel was a little more restrictive. And plus, we're going to hear about Jeremy Doncaster's dream meeting in Speedway Paradise at the end as well, describing where his dream meeting would be and who would be riding in it. So sit back and relax, pour yourself a glass of something nice, whatever that might be, and enjoy the company of one of Great Britain's great Speedway riders, Jeremy Doncaster. Welcome to Humans of Speedway. <laughs> Thank you. Here he is, and uh, you've uh, well, we, we've we've made it through almost one year of lockdown at the time of recording, and uh, we're heading into 2021. Before we start with looking back on your career, what what are you up to these days, uh, Jeremy? I think would be one of the main um, questions probably people are wondering now. Um, well, I have worked all the way through the um, pandemic, so um, and I'm, I'm actually. Uh, work on an MOD site, you know, on the the local airfield at Watersham. Oh, okay. As a oh, yeah. um, as a project manager, um, so as you can imagine, because of because of COVID, there was a lot of extra work um, we had to put in in place, and obviously um, uh, the world doesn't stop as far as um, defence is concerned. So uh, we've never been so busy, to be honest really busy my heart goes out to uh, a lot of people who have their businesses have suffered particularly speedway um as in um the entertainment businesses and uh and um your day-to-day -day, your food your pubs your restaurants i mean um yeah my heart goes out for them yeah, absolutely. And um, hopefully, though, once we get through all this, uh, some speedway at the end of it. And um, let's hope it can be a better year than, than 2020 was, fingers crossed. Let's um, turn about our attention to your story then, Jeremy. I mean, where does your relationship with bikes go back to? I mean, from the earliest age, what's your earliest memory of getting on a bike? I mean, was it, uh, was it a motorbike or, or was it, um, you know, like many of us with, uh, with stabilizers wobbling around? <laughs> um... Well, I didn't have stabilizers, but I, I had an old moped I bought off um, Alec Gooch. We call him Alec the Jap. You know, he's still yeah, quite yeah. Um, active on social media. With his, uh, he's got so many of them and restored so many of them. So um, yeah, he, he sold me a, um, a, a mobile moped, and it was uh, all cut down with um, without the pedals or one pedal was a footrest on one side and. Um, and I rode it around the back garden at my dad's. And then because we got um, complaints from the neighbours, because it didn't have any baffles in the exhaust pipe, it's just like a real noisy, annoying lawnmower, really. <laughs> so you can understand it, really. The neighbours soon got fed up. And um, I was quite fortunate because down the road um, uh, lived someone who called Pete Davey, who owned Davey Brothers Motorcycles, who um, he kind of... Uh, popped around and says, oh, you know, um, you may be interested in this. There's a Norfolk and Suffolk motorcycle club has just launched and it's for, um, and they're looking for members. So, you know, you, you, you know, you're upsetting the neighbours around here, so it doesn't upset me, but, um, you know, do you want to come along and have a look and join? And I did. And, um, and the other thing is that built up a relationship with me and, and Pete and Davey brothers. And uh, they kind of took me under their wing, really, and uh, supported me. I, w I worked in a motorbike shop um, well, before I left school, really. I mean, the school used to ring up and find and, and say, where the hell are you? And where is he? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, <laughs> so he said, yeah, yeah he's all right. He's, he's safe, so don't worry. And um, 
yeah, and, and let the su the su support me through the grass tracking. Uh, Hon and because it's a Honda agency as well, so I had to back in the Honda UK, which I won a British Championship on in the early 80s. And um, first bike was a 500 Jet, and, uh, which I restored and is in the workshop today. Oh, wow. So you still got the original bike? I've got the first and I've got the last. I've got the, the, the one I broke my leg on in um, my farewell in Germany and handles that. That last ever race, and then that were quite a badly broken leg. So that was a, just a, a warning shot. Thought I was going to get away with it all after 25 years plus. <laughs> and it was, uh, yeah, you know, uh, just a little um, wake up call that was. Severe injuries are uh, a reality of, of Speedway, of course. You never know what's around the corner, but it's unfortunate when you have such a long and illustrious career in the sport, similar to when I spoke to Gary Havelock a while ago, that when you go out for what should be a routine ride and your career is ended there and then, you know, you haven't got the chance to do with a big farewell and, and all that kind of stuff. It's, um, it's sort of a sad way to, uh, an unfortunate way as well, to, to end a great career. No, that's right. I mean, Heavy's was uh, life changing as well, and, um, and my brother had a life changing um, injury as well, uh, similar to Gary's, where he lost the use of his arm, and he overcame it um, in his garage business. Uh, he had several operations and managed to get partial use back in it, so he was able to um, not be disabled as such. Mm -hmm. Uh, was still just slightly disabled, but you wouldn't actually notice it. And he went on to um, uh, get an ACU like motocross license, and, you know. And uh, the, the medical panel came and viewed him, um, watched him ride, and said, "Yeah, he's safe enough to to have a license again." So um, he sort of rode with a partial disability, which was which was amazing, really. But it does it. it you get injuries and small injuries. I mean, I've, I've ridden with sort of partially healed collarbones and they're dreadfully painful and, and it really does slow you down. And uh, niggling injuries like strained knees and ligaments and you, the, the season's only short, so you have to get, you have to knuckle on and, and get on with it and, and um, block out the pain. And obviously we, um, we had some um, quite fortunate uh, physiotherapists who were on top of the game at the time, specialising in sports injuries. People like Brian Simpson was local in it, which, and in actual fact, he looked after um, a lot of the footballers and sports injuries. And he, and he, he used to say the Speedway guys are a lot, lot tougher, as in mm. you want to earn money, you want to ride. And he, he said, I know that, you know, what I'm doing. It, it may speed, it may help to the, the process of healing, but he said it won't. He said, if you ride, that would be painful. There's no doubts about it. <laughs> it's one of those things, though, that makes Speedway what it is, isn't it? Where you get riders who, for whatever reason, whether it's the money, whether it's they don't want to give their team place up, whether it's fighting for a world championship, that they do find a way of of going through the pain barrier and it just shows what tough characters speedway riders are or or maybe what what crazy characters yeah. they are yeah yeah I, I think you hit the nail on the head really I, I think it really depends how how high your pain threshold is really some some can do it and some can't you know so um, you, you know take me out of to anyone who, who can you know it's a uh, um, fair fight but it does um it does knock you back a bit, and if, you, if to try to find form and try to earn money out of it, and try which is obviously scoring points, it does make it um, a lot, a lot, a lot tougher than it already is. It's already got so many variables in it anyway, yeah, um, yeah. as in track conditions and sort of, um, you know, if you choose a correct bike or whatever you're doing on the particular night. If you're feeling good as well in yourself, that's so much of it. There's so many variables. Um, you know, if, if someone's upset you the, just before you're going out for a race, you know, that, that all plays on your mind. 
I always remember that footage of Kenny Carter uh, trying to get to the world final with a broken leg and he was being lifted out of his wheelchair and onto a bike and then back off again afterwards. You know, I think that kind of level is, uh, you know, the extreme, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> well, I was, I was actually in that British final and, and uh, I think the one afterwards as well and, and I just couldn't believe it. Well, if you look at the boots, you know, you can see the difference in size. Uh, and I've got to have a special cast on, so I have no movement on my right leg. So it's hard work when you're riding because you can't manoeuvre the bike the same, so it's difficult. You know, and, uh, well, he won the British final with a broken leg and a solid plaster cast it was. He couldn't, you know, how the hell, you know, he managed to do it. I don't think he's in particular pain, but it shows what, um, what tremendous skill he had to... Uh, to uh, to ride, mind you, commentary and uh, probably any other track where you've got to turn really, really hard and and sharp, he may have struggled. But um, certainly at commentary, it's fairly slick that day, so it's qu quite easy to ride. And and of course, he was making tremendous starts. If this meeting would have been nowhere else in England, everybody would have rode. They would have had to ride. I think they will they will ride today. But if you look on the inside where people's rode. It's dry. I mean, you can see the track over there. There's no problem. It's on the outside where it's wet, but nobody rides there. And I think the problem is, because it's raining, a few riders have scored no points or one point, and they don't want to carry on. I've won one race. I might come last in my next race, but and I've got a broken leg. You know, I've got a broken leg, and I'd like to ride. And if it was that bad, I wouldn't want to ride. But, Referee's just announced we're carrying on. But if... if if you look at the track at Oxford, I've got a video of that meeting, and the track was worse than this, and it was pissing down. It was raining. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he he showed true Yorkshire grit, you know. And, uh... <laughs> From where putting it? <laughs> <laughs> no, brilliant rider. <laughs> so you you came through the the grass track um, scene, which so many riders of of your era. Uh, did you know and and it was um it was a great grounding that's not really there so much now and, and not so prevalent it's more sort of motocross if anything isn't it that's leading to speedway these days but it was a great grounding because a lot of the riders i imagine that you were riding with uh grass track and and so on also went to join you in speedway well that's right yeah um so there's uh me wiggy uh simon cross um even Calvin, he, he went um, from motocross to, to speedway and then on, on, on grass track as well. So, um, and I think when, you, when you're, Peter Collins is another one, um, when you're invo involved in the, the, the different disciplines of the sport, um, I mean, you, got, you have a track racing license, that's what they call it, track racing, and that covers you for all disciplines, which is ice speedway, which I didn't actually... Uh, do I mean the indoor but um it's an ice speedway sand track long track um speedway so you might as well use it yeah cost yeah. you 350 pound a year or whatever it was I think it was then so um you might as well ride in the vents and you could quite often you could have a rolling chassis um sitting there and just bolt one of your um speedway engines in which up to about 800 metres, six to 800 metres was ample, um, ample quick enough. It was only when you went on the full thousand metres, you really needed something, um, you know, something a bit special or probably something off one of the, one of the engine tuners. You mm. know. Um, yeah, that's it. Cause it, it's just, you know, you haven't really got much time to get things right on those thousand metres. So it's a, probably better it's easier just to to get to get a rental for the day yeah I spoke to calvin tatum before christmas in um i think actually the last episode before this before the end of the year last year and um yeah he was talking about long track obviously he he firmly covered long track but he, he went on to long track after the majority of his speedway career if you know what i mean he sort of focused on that later on yeah i, I mean i was well, obviously racing through that era as well with Kelvin. Yeah. So Kelvin and Simon as well. So um, I think he did have a go initially. Um, he went to Herxheim early on and didn't have a very good time of it. And I remember him saying, he said, I'm going to come back to this because this is something needs more more time and attention. And probably it may have been seven or eight years before he actually came back to it. And then... Um, 
that gave it his all, you know, and um, fair play to him. In actual fact, I've got his book for Christmas, so, and uh, I've just been, I've got, I haven't read much of it yet, but the first four chapters and got to um, uh, his wife, Debbie's, Debbie's part, and, and just said to my wife, I said, it's very, very sim a familiar story that is, you know. You know, tough life, very selfish people we are. <laughs> <laughs> and you had to bring up the family single handedly, basically. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's resonated with you then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very, I, I don't know what the next chapters are going to be, but I, I should imagine they're fairly similar. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, um, I mean, from my memory and, and, um, it might be slightly um, hazy or incorrect, but f f the way I saw um, Speedway at the time, and I, when I was growing up, I was a um, Halifax fan, and then Halifax, of course, moved to Bradford, so only used to get to see you when you were uh, a visiting rider more often than not, despite what Wikipedia says that you were a Bradford rider, which is, um, I believe, that's, incorrect. That's not right. Yeah, that is incorrect. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know <laughs> how they get the wrong information, really, but... Yeah, um, yeah, but I, I used to love Halifax. Actually, it's one of my favourite tracks. One of them. I, I, I can remember first going there um, for the witches. Well, in '82, when I when I um, when I first started, and Kevin Jolly was said, "Oh, he said, oh, you wait, you, you wait till you get to Halifax, and you know." And, and uh, I had this picture of this. He said the banking. He'd never seen banking like it, and uh, and I was. Expected to see this track like a, I don't know, like a bank in the, you know, the, the size of a house. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I was actually, I was going to the meeting with him. And I was actually terrified what was gonna, what it's going to be like. And when I looked at it, I just said, I said, that's nothing. He said, what do you mean? He, he said, no, nah, I've ridden um, grass tracks with more banking than that. And he said, where? And I said, well. Stats Canal in Holland. I said, it's got double the bank in Halifax. He's so I, I just was like a duck to water, you know, straight up to the at the top of the, you know, up the top of the bank in and running down it and had a whale of the time. I used to love it, absolutely love it. A lot of people found it a little bit narrow, but it was um, it was certainly a fast track that I remember, and the the, the memories are fairly hazy. But it was uh, it was big. I remember the big bends, and there was a lot of passing on the bends, uh, particularly there at Halifax, as I recall. That's right. Yeah, I mean you can um, you can use the bank, and it's if you, if you if you read it right, um, you could say you could go up to the bank and make a straight off the top of it. You know, turn at the top of it, make the big long straight, and and pass people. On the, on the exit of the corners and just before it now narrow, narrow, narrows up on the straight if you left it a little bit too late then you you know you, you nipped your uh, opponent up against the fence a little bit which they probably didn't really like that too much yeah. <laughs> it was always a bit of a cinder track as well wasn't it rather than rather shale that you, shale you get these days it was always sort of a more of a gray appearance yeah that, I, I like the surface actually it's very much um very consistent and uh, it, it, it never used to sort of um, chop up like the red shell. The red shell used to get quite, um, quite holy, and sometimes um, if it rained, it used to get quite heavy and lumpy. But uh, that that surface, that cinders, that is more uh, well. To, to be honest, it, it's more like um, the early Polish tracks. Mm. You know, they, they had that uh, uh, type of type of surface where you just sort of prepared it with water and uh, and you, you could sort of use the water, pull all the stuff back, relay it, and, and you're constantly sort of having a new track after every batch of sort of four, six races whenever you want to feel like preparing the track again. So it's quite, quite unique. I, th I think there probably should be more of it, but, um, yeah, sadly, that the shade, that, that went, didn't it? Yeah, um, it did, and um, I mean the Shea is still there, but it's just a football ground now. Um, no speedway track around it. Of course, they moved to to Bradford, Bradford. in nineteen eighty six. Yeah. I think it was after the World Final in eighty five. Um, yeah, I, I, I rode with Kenny actually the very the, on the trial meeting in um, at Bradford when they the Hand Brothers moved up, and they I think they opened it up, didn't they? With yeah, with Eric Eric Boothroyd. and. Um, 
yeah, with Kenny. Kenny did the press launch, and, uh, and then we had a practice, and, um, and then we had uh, the, one of the World Team Cup qualifiers there. I think Ivan, Ivan was um, riding there with his son Kim, um, and it's me, Kenny. Might have been Kelvin as well. I think. I think we were. That was when John Berry was um, uh, England team manager. And he uh, mm-hmm. kind of. Uh, was going for more, you know, for, for the youth. I think um, I think Mort was still in it. I can't remember, to be honest. It's a little bit of a... That's the trouble. It all becomes a bit of a blur. <laughs> I remember but, yourself and, I mean, what I was getting around to saying actually before was that I remember yourself and Kelvin actually kind of being the, you know, coming through the ranks uh, with the, what was then the England team. and um, And it seemed... Certainly, my impression in, in my mind was that it, it was the two of you really were the the new order, and and you were taking over from the the kind of the, the old guard, if you want to call them that, of of the sort of late seventies, early eighties, and it sort of seemed to be yourself and and Kelvin that were leading that charge, and then there was Wiggy uh, also there as well, and um, you know, and then um, Chris Louie and, and and riders like that all sort of got in on the yeah. end. You pretty much summed it up, to be honest. And um, I say we we were taken over from the old guard with you know PC and more. You know um, they were uh, still still competitive, but perhaps a little bit lost their edge a little bit. Um, and we, you know I think it needed fresh blood. Which um, of course when we first started we were you know lacking experience and had to um, had to grow up pretty damn quick. And um, but also we had to raise our game, and we we we, we needed um, we could see that we needed to do it, and we had to learn how to do it as well. And and uh, and the Danes were so good at that time. Jeremy Doncaster in blue. Next to him in yellow, black Eric Gunderson. In three, we'll have Chris Morton, and on the outside, Hans Nielsen in white. The Danes won heat one in a canter. England have uh, fought back now just eight points down. It's an important heat, heat five psychologically as well as on track. Under orders now. Keeping a long time. Get up to the first corner. It looks as though England's got away. It's a terrific start from the England pairing. Goodison makes his run down the inside. It's Morton in front. Second place is Doncaster. Third place is Goodison and Nielsen busting a gun around the outside now. And we have a fair speedway race on now. And with the help of British Cole as well. Um, your coal products limited and under the different banners yeah, sunrise or things like home that. fire yeah mm. furnace site and sit fuels and, and I say with with Simon or the two Simon Simon Wig Simon Cross um, Kelvin as well and Kelvin got support later on from from, from them that kind of um, helped to uh, raise our game and 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 it wasn't just it wasn't just equipment. A lot of it, some of it was equipment. We didn't. We, we, some of us we didn't. We didn't always have uh, the quantity of, of of fast stuff or or bikes we preferred to ride. So um, we had to sort of slowly build up a stable of of good equipment, which is hard to do, um, particularly when they you know when, when you the, the early GMs you could get you could get a rocket ship one week and then the next minute it's in a, mm. you got it in a bin you know it's just, <laughs> they used to just blow up so so often which is so it's, it's just as well Sunbright did sponsors because um, you know with uh, with explosions like that you know you could you could sort of do several thousand pounds worth of damage within within a couple of couple of weeks yeah. you know without. Yeah. Uh, so um, and that really and, and the other thing was the mental thing and and that was possibly the hardest uh, and which took the longest to to um, to get our heads around to 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 get that level up and uh, and I think when we uh, we were ready for uh, ready for it at Bradford and um, that was was so so um, so unfortunate when Eric had his crash and mm-hmm. and we all felt for it and you, you can imagine how deflated um, the England side were with, with um, Colin Pratt 
you know, being the the team manager for Cradley, um, he, he was well, he he was a shadow of himself. He really was, and um, you know, although we we're, we're we're rivals on the on the track, rival countries, but we're we're, we're all good buddies as well. So um, effective all of us, all of us, but we we are ready to put on the show, and I, and I think. Um, the, the Danes were ready for a, a strong fight. And mm. um, I think even had Eric not had his crash, I think um, we, we would have won that day anyway. But it's just unfortunate that um, um, well, of, of what happened, really. As riders, how aware of the severity of the situation were you? Obviously, there was um, British riders, English riders caught up in that um, crash as well because all four riders went down how aware were you as to how severe this was we we knew more than the public knew um and um we could tell something wasn't quite right the um the way peter york was uh, relaying messages which um i think pete was absolutely shocked and uh it's a very very difficult situation to um, well to to, to to announce to the public really, mm. um, but uh, we we knew things weren't right and you could and um, we, we spoke to Hans and the Danish team manager and, and and they were really really worried about him and and obviously his wife Hella uh, went went to the hospital in the ambulance and she was called down and so we knew it was very serious and. Uh, and of course, Simon Cross as well. He took a tumble. I think Ricky Miller as well. So I think that I think all four in that um, that race. Obviously, Eric had life changing injuries, didn't he? I mean, that was and uh, that's one of the that's one of the things when you get on the way at the meeting, you don't you know the, the law of averages. You're going to have a you're going to have a get off and have a crash, and you might hurt yourself. You might break something, but um, you, you don't really think you're going to not come home that day with it, you know, with life changing injuries. And that's, um, and that's sort of the luck, the, the luck of the draw, I guess, or the roll of the dice. Yeah. I mean, back to what we were saying earlier about injuries. I know that when we, uh, when I spoke to Gary Havelock and he was saying about, you know, wow, he's, had a life-changing injury but he's still thankful in in some respects because you know he, he hasn't had a, an injury like that or like Darcy Ward or um you know so many well, others in the, in the past yeah. that have Per Jonsson of course you know one of yeah, your uh, uh, Lawrence Hare I mean there's mm. it, uh, well Joe Owen Alan Wilkinson I mean there's this you know it, it does happen you know and it does that just uh, brings it home to you We'll talk more about that meeting in just a bit because obviously it was a major event, the World Team Cup in, in 1989. We'll come back to that. I'm just going to talk about your your time at Ipswich first because you were uh, a big rider for your local team, um, spent the most time of any of your clubs at, uh, at Ipswich and it must be great riding for your hometown club. Yes, uh, li- li- living in the town, um, that was really fortunate Um one thing, it's not far to travel to the meeting, so yeah, it makes interested. it handy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and um, you know, there's a good vibes. Good vibes are in the town. You know, I was a, like the new kid on the block when I started in '82. I had a couple of stints. I, I had, uh, I think, I had ten years at Reading. What was it? Uh, no, five years at Reading, in between. So, but I had my ten-year testimonial at uh, Reading uh, that followed on. From um, from when I had to leave it, switch when they dropped down to um, to uh, to the national league mm-hmm. or the second division. Um, so yeah, I, I mean I was um, you know was in the blaze of glory to be the, the new John Louis, and um, which is you know uh, uh, going to always going to be a tough act to follow. And uh, it took. Took a little while to find my feet. I think um, I ended up the year with a broken, broken ankle, but I did manage to um, get one paid maximum in my first British League season, which I was quite chuffed with, and, and a fairly healthy average. Um, 
but it, it, I, I think the deep tracks, early season tracks, the late season tracks, I think the the the, the ability of the um, the uh, advantage of having the experience of the grass tracks uh, and the long tracks, the, the multidiscipline sport, um, helped um, speed my development up. And I think I made a um, 83 was a bit of a standstill year. Um, I managed, actually, I did manage to win the European Grass Trap Championship in 82 as well, which was the debut speedway season. And that kind of, when things were going bad on the speedway or not, not how I wanted it to go on the speedway, at the weekends I was grass tracking somewhere and, and um, that gave me um, uh, something to, put, to regain my confidence. I hadn't got to dwell on things. I hadn't had time to dwell on things, which was, which was good. I was very busy. <laughs> and um, and that uh, I think that was probably uh, a, a bit of advantage having a, a, another discipline not in it, not in your local town because you you're not hearing how how dreadful you did that night. Or <laughs> and the, the grass track um, um, a much more obviously continental thing as well because you'd be travelling to places like Germany and Belgium and and places like that I imagine for these rounds. That's right, yeah, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't so easy getting about those days either. You had to have carnets for your bikes, um, which when, when I was kind of dreading it, um, you know, Brexit, when they're talking about the borders and bits and pieces. I thought, well, yeah, yeah we're going backwards, and I, and I can remember exactly what it's like. I can remember going through. We had to build up, buy these carnets for the bikes, and. Um, and you stamp them in each country and then you stamp them out of each country you go through. And sometimes you sort of, when, when you, you know, you've only got, say, 26 um, sheets of paper left in your car and, a, and you think, well, I've got another few trips to do yet. You, you try and just stamp in, a, in out of one country like France and out of France, but, and try and sneak, sneak through um, Belgium, Holland and into Germany. <laughs> but the, the the issue with doing that is if you got caught, you got sent all the way back to the country where you should have um, stamped into. Oh, so, man. yeah, which it, it's happened. It's happened twice. Yeah. You know, I've got and it's normally in Holland, and trying going out of Holland, they're just waiting for you, and they say, well, and they, they actually followed us up the road, pulled us in. The customs have said, you haven't stamped for your bikes. You know, you must go back, and they followed us for three and a half hours back to the border to make sure I got the stamp. Oh wow! Said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so you had to drive all the way back across Holland again, and then and then obviously yeah. do your Germany journey you're originally going to do. Yes, that's that, yeah, that's oh. right. Yeah, yeah. So it, it, you know, it's a slap, slap on the wrist that was. Yeah. Uh, so either that or get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> because in this time as well, you, you, you're talking about uh, obviously the the Berlin Wall would still be up, and you, the, it's the Cold War and the, the Iron Curtain, yeah. and having to try yeah. and visit all these places. I, I suspect that you've got stories of uh, of extreme travel. I, I know that I, I saw something in the Speedway Star a while back that you you went to Russia, and yes. uh, yeah. and I yeah. think you went well prepared, didn't you? Well, we did in Russia. I mean, I mean, all those Eastern Bloc countries, you had to be well prepared. And um, and one one of the biggest issues was um, you had to get an invite from the um, from the governing body to actually for the event before you could apply for a visa. So you could imagine, sort of, if you're riding in Poland or Czechoslovakia or even like say like um, I think it was Rovno, wasn't it? No, not Rovno. That was. Um, Oh, where is it? The Russian semi-final. That is, um, but you you can imagine that um, your passport was away permanently um, applying for permits and visas. So I had to go to the town hall and I had to run two passports to get through the season. <laughs> and and um, although you know you you well you probably get strung up today but well you would get strung up for sure but then you could you could apply for your the, the passports passports were issued or the yearly passports were issued from the town hall so i had to go to the town hall and and speak to the um very nicely explain the situation with my dates and where i was going to and 
explained that I needed to get a, um, a yearly passport, a temporary passport, while my permanent passport was away, and they, which you're not actually supposed to do, but they did actually, they had the, what's they called, discrepancy to, to do that. There's several things going on in the Eastern Bloc. Um, I said the borders opened up in 89, and um, I, I think that was that, uh, Rob, no, that was it 89 or 90, I can't remember, but that was around that time. And uh, when we got back to the Polish border, you probably read it in the Speedway Star, but um, uh, Gorbachev had got kidnapped. So had we had not um, left then, because Pete, Peter Collins came with us as well, as uh, one, one thing he wanted to um, go to Russia. And the other thing, he, he, he he's, he's good to have around, you know, and uh, for, for meetings like that as well. And um, and we wanted to stay an extra couple of days and sort of have a good look around the place. But <laughs> when we when we realised that that wasn't going to happen, and that was more or less instant, as soon as we got th through the Polish border into in, into into the Ukraine, and uh, we had literally police go police escort at the front. Police got escort at the back, and it was all the nations, you know, everyone met, you mm. know, at, um, just before the border in Brest. And um, that was, uh, I think, um, Ty's, actually, Ty's dad, um, Rob Ruffenden, was on that trip. I think he was with um, Billy Hamill, I believe, helping out Billy. So, oh, really? Well, wow. yeah, he was, yeah. <laughs> so uh, he often used to say, he said, oh, I ain't. You don't get many trips like that anymore, do you? I said, no, you don't. I said, you're... and the thing is, you ought to talk to the ice guys as well, um, Abdi Group and people like that, because we used to see them in the grass tracks, and that they they used to uh, be uh, ice racers as well in the winter, and and that, they'll tell you stories where they got hijacked, you know, um, to try to find these um, speedway tracks in Russia where they get robbed, you know, they go in a big bus and they just get stop but on the side of the road with uh you know rocket launchers not just just sort of you know ak-47s they're just God. <laughs> yeah they, <laughs> they can tell you some um hell of a stories and uh so we were worried and we did we we were prepared um so yeah there's a there's a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was to get to the 1991 world final from looking at it Gothenburg, wasn't it? Yeah. I mean, another plane after that world final, I had another, another nightmare plane journey after that as well with Mitch, Mitch Shearer. That was in that uh, Vilgard. It's painted like a painted like a dragonfly, that was. We, we went to Gothenburg Airport and looked at this plane and it and it, uh, it had wheels on it the size of a wheelbarrow. And we were going, it took us seven hours in, in the Poland. We had to uh, land somewhere for fuel. I don't know where we landed, but never went through any customs. Took off again on a grass field. Uh, we're overweight, could barely take off. When we did take off, we had to do a hard sort of right turn, just miss the top of a church spire. And, um, and me and Mitch, we're just like, we, we're not going to survive this. You know, that one stage going across the sea, we're going, actually going sideways. We weren't going forwards. So um, we actually got, well, we actually landed and got to the track. We actually got off the plane and kissed the grass, you know, just actually kissed it. <laughs> um, it, sh it shouldn't take seven hours to get from um, Sweden to Poland, I'm pretty sure. No, it shouldn't do. No, <laughs> but... <laughs> they might do one going a... round in circles. Yeah, if there's a strong headwind and you're going against it, it does. My God. <laughs> yeah. It's we, we a were, nightmare. Yeah, that was a nightmare. It really was. I mean, it, it, I spoke to Mitch last year. He really rang up, and, and, and the first thing he said was, oh, do you remember that that trip to Poland, you know, from from Sweden to Poland? And I went, oh, no, that plane, that, that plane, <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> it's, it's not the speedway that's dangerous by the sound of it. It's the transport. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, there's some. We've had some horrendous trips. Yeah, and the uh, couple of years before yeah. that, uh, on the on the world um, championship front, as we mentioned, uh, Gothenburg. But your your biggest uh, 
success would be in uh, in Munich at the Olympic Stadium there, 1989. I mean, what are your memories of that meeting? Um, well, 89 was a um, good year, sort of like um, team-wise, uh, individual-wise, and um, yeah, I say the World Team Cup. Um, we achieved them Munich. The track here is 400 metres. The show for Speedway lay directly on the running surface. This makes it a little narrow for Speedway and the starts are going to be vital. Once in front, a rider will be in charge. Passing will probably be at a premium. For heat number one, on the inside, Jeremy Doncaster from England in the red helmet colour. Bohemil Brahel from Prague, Czechoslovakia. Gate two, Mitch Shearer, gate three, and Andy Smith from England, gate four. And into the first bend and coming through on the inside, Jeremy Doncaster pursued quickly by the New Zealander, Mitch Shearer. Shearer trying to get through on the inside, but Doncaster holding him. Back in third is Andy Smith, and at the back, the Czechoslovakian looks outclassed. Um, to get in a runoff for second place, um, shame I didn't win the runoff, but um, it's probably the worst start I made all night. Well, it was the worst start I made all night. Um, lack of concentration. It was a runoff with uh, Simon Wig, a, a, a good yeah. friend of yours as well. That's right. Yeah, I remember we stood on the rostrum, and he and, and, we, and he he said this will sort us out for the long track for a few more years now. You know, and <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, and we sort of like <laughs> we're, we're chatting away and sort of. Um, uh, working out how much start money we can ask. <laughs> <laughs> Your value just that went was up. on the rostrum. <laughs> yeah, it did, yeah. Because <laughs> quite often uh, the Germans at least are like watching um, the, 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 the British battle, you know, on the grass tracks. Hans Zerk used to love it. He said, oh, the two Englishmen, they are fighting so hard. You know, and we'll have... Really good races abroad, um, me and Simon. But the man who won the world title, 29-year-old Dane from Brost, Hans Nielsen, Simon Wigg in second place, Jeremy Doncaster third, four English riders in the top seven. Quite a day for British Speedway. But the man who won the world title undoubtedly celebrates in the Olympic Stadium in Munich. He is, of course, Hans Nielsen. 89 was a, having a good year, and probably 1990, I was probably even... Um, 1990, really was the one where <clears throat> that the, the final would have been at Bradford had I would have made it. And I went out at um, Felsted, but that was the year where I thought, well, I can be world champion that year. And um, uh, Hans was difficult, to, was was harder to beat than Eric, to be honest. Um, although, like I was saying, we, we had learned how to up our game and raise our game. And we were able to do it at the higher at, 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 at that level in the higher meetings, and 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 the world final at Munich just sort of um, uh, rubber stamped that. So 1990 was 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 for me should have been the one, but um, that's that went pear shaped at, at uh, Felsted. And I, I won the overseas final on a 15 point maximum, and then. Um, and then Hardy scored a, scored a point in um, Denmark, which had dreadfully slipped, which is, it just totally caught us out, um, which is a shame because Bradford was uh, one of my favourite tracks, or ro I certainly rode well there as, as well as anyone else there. Obviously, Reading, um, Per was one of my teammates. Well, the, 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 he was my teammate. Uh, and I actually went up there and mechanic for... Um, Amando, actually, I was in his corner of the pits, so oh, I was, okay. um, I was talk, talking talking to Per, you know, through through the meeting. Or, or well, actually, he wasn't talking a lot because he's in there in there just so focused. He was, um, uh, you, well, no one could talk to him to be honest. It's just um, more or less curled up in a ball, just sort of like shaking. I think that's the word. <laughs> yeah, I, I was at the yeah, 1990 World Final, and it was it was you know it was an exciting meeting, and um, it, it it did um, it, it would have lent itself to you though because you you were a you were a fan of Bradford, I think, as a, as a rider. You always seemed to do pretty well there. Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Um, so we was there on one of the opening rounds for uh, for the World Team Cup qualifiers, and um, always scored well there and uh like the big big open space the banking could use the banking um 
yeah, loved the place. Um, but um, yeah, it wasn't to be. Yeah, you can't. It's life, isn't it? Really, sometimes it, it sometimes it goes your way, sometimes it doesn't go your way. I mean, you look look at ninety one World Final Gothenburg. It's good to get there. Um, shocking meeting. Um, couldn't we were there for three days. Couldn't get any of the bikes through the scrutineers with the noise control, and I'm sure. Um, something was going on there with the noise control because um, I don't I don't know but I know Mitch kicked it across the centre green which did, probably didn't help and he asked for the calibrations to do again and he, he said well he didn't calibrate it now as he boots it across the centre green so I mean that probably didn't help <laughs> <laughs> that's one way of dealing with it I had to borrow a yeah, I, know, yeah. I had a race with a, um, a borrowed silencer off a vintage bike in the car park, and and that just about knocked any horsepower the poor thing had. You know, it just so uh, you might as well just cross us out, cross us out, cross us out of the book on that one. And uh, I was bit bitterly disappointed. Um, but I think from that, I mean, I was it um, he- heavily involved in the. Um, and the making of those silences as well, you know, the straight through pipe with Richard Arben, and um, and and uh, you know we with hands Jan Anderson, uh, we, we were for the straight through silence, so we were um, putting a testing regime and a report to the BSBA and uh, said that for safety reasons these are probably the safer to use than the megaphones, right, which. Which at the time, I think, think at the time they they wanted to go to twenty eight mil carb uh, twenty eight mil restrictors, which we we tried those with a comparison to um, a straight through silencer, and the straight through silencer uh, had a double a double win really that had um, uh, reduced noise and obviously. Um, uh, a smoother power delivery, which we felt for um, new, new guys coming into the sport, new new riders trying to uh, have a feel for the bike, uh, would would um, would improve the safety of the sport, which which that, that sold it to the BSBA, and obviously then that, that and then it followed on for the FIM, and then after that all the noise controls went out the window because they're all. Um, you know, uh, rubber stamps with a hologram mark on them. When you look at the machines from the time when you were riding, you were very much in the in the upright era, uh, which upright speed will be very pleased about, I'm sure. Um, but when you look at the modern machines, because you are one of the machine examiners at Ipswich, so you get to have a, a good look at the, the, the modern bikes that are being used now, lay down engines and all sorts of tweaks that come along from season to season. Are we in a better place now with the current machinery or or were the old, uh, the old uprights still the best? Well, it's, it's questionable, really, because, I, I mean, an example is, I've probably told told the story before, but um, I went, I was invite, invited back to the Czech Golden Helmet, um, their 70th anniversary a couple of years ago, and uh, and it was, all the past winners were were invited, and um, John Davis is there, uh, my old buddy, Dennis Segalos as well, um, and Han, Samson Nielsen. Uh, Yuri Stansel and, and, and Ollie, Ollie Olsen. And we all um, stopped at the same place and had, had you know, supper together. And uh, we're, we're chatting away and actually at the stadium, we, we were um, in their bureau and on, on, on their back wall, they've got a, um, uh, an engraving of, um, I suppose it's like a golf, you know what they have past winners and the the, the times and the, the results of the uh, of the top six in the final. You know from four to seventy years, and we went through it and we, was, um, with Ollie and we say, oh look, that's because Ollie won stacks of them. You know yeah. five, yeah. six. You know and and I said, oh look at the times. That was, uh, he said, yeah, that'd be uh, that'd be on the two valve jar. That'd be the long stroke one. That would be the short stroke. Two valve, you know, and 
And uh, I said, well, look at the times. And then we then we went when um, Dennis won it on, on you know, the four valve Wesley. And it's probably like four seconds different. And then sort of like the next five years, and I won, you know, uh, one in 89 and then another one in 90. And I was on um, upright um, GMs then, but we had like um, a decent um, bit of rubber. You know, we had soft compound tyres and then you go back 30 years I think Jason Doyle's won it two or three times I think the last couple of years it's probably two, but his first first time he wrote which was written on the board um, I saw look at the time and there's uh, not even a tenth of a second between his winning time and my winning time in 89 and I said well look at that and Ollie said well that can't be right and he, he said, he said, well, that's the answer then. We, we go back to uprights. <laughs> 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 and we had a decent time. Oh, my word, the noise, the atmosphere is electric. Douglas around the outside, and Casper now comes up to take the lead. Casper takes the lead. Douglas to back on him. My word, what a race. What a race as they come out of the final two turns. And that's going to be Douglas to the win. Douglas to get to the checkered flag in first place. Second place is Tony Casper. Third is Zenedict Tassar. Fourth is Gary Havelock. Fifth, Mitch Shearer. Sixth, fourth, thought. But just look at Jeremy Douglas Athens, sir. He's so pleased with life. Shaking hands with Tony Casper, Gary Havelock, and all the rest of them. But Jeremy Doncaster, of course, from the Reading 4X racers in England, who has done the work, but not to overcome. A terrific challenge by Tony Casper on the last lap. All the track staff, and there we see Martin Dugan, the first one out to congratulate him. His mechanic, Dougie, and are we going to get the traditional bumps? We'll have to wait and see if they will. There has been a hell of a lot of change, and then obviously went to lay down after that, and but um, but we went on less, less rubber. And I th think... Um, Probably the uh, the modern day speed riders today they they haven't learned with uh, the um, with, with the different disciplines of the sport and the um, and and when you've you've got a decent tire under you and you have to be over the front all the time to sort of counter counterbalance any type of hole or grip you know you know I mean we we could sort of ride through. Uh, a, a real rough trap with holes and if you're up over the front of the bike and roll the throttle off and and you got your weight in the right place you could you could pass people through the holes in control mm. and um but when it when i look at some of the gps you have one hole in there off the off the back of the thing and they're, they're just in, in the air fence and I, and I think well and they blame the blame the track and i thought well that can't be right you know no one blames the track the, the track didn't cause a the, the crash <laughs> so, <laughs> how about looking at the guy on the bike <laughs> well, exactly yeah and um that's what that's how things have changed and i don't think they ride the the, the successful riders the modern day riders of t the, today who are still successful or very successful are the up front over the front riders who've got that control and that's pr probably um because they've learned that way but the ones hanging off the thing um, I, I don't think they probably they probably won't probably race for thirty years for or twenty five thirty years shall I say because they're just sort of you think well blimey I don't think they're going to make tomorrow no matter then you know mm. you, know, you can't be old fashioned technique. No, I mean I mean we still had good races we could sort of respect to each other um, as they do today, but. Um, it, it it felt safer you could you could I, I mean I used to ride shoulder to shoulder with Armando Castagna at Reading and we'd literally be rubbing shoulders team riding down the straight for four laps we used to frighten each other no you know because <laughs> we still hit a few holes and but we were able to control them you know we, we could control it with the with the throttle with the bikes you know and um you know you know, if it, if, it, if it picked a bit more grip, you just sort of rolled it off and it took you away from the fence. It appears to be nowadays, if you pick up, um, hit some dirt, 
it pulls you into the fence, which uh, the bikes never used to do that with the era I rode. Later on, they did, but um, the early laydowns when we adapted them, they they were probably the um, the easiest and probably the safest to ride. So perhaps go revert back to what the guys were riding probably ten years ago, and it um, yeah may, maybe maybe a few less less crashes perhaps. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, possibly yeah. so. And 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 a decent tire. You give them a decent tire, and you know the guys will have to ride up over the front. Otherwise, I wouldn't stay on them. And you do, there is one heck of a difference. But I say the, the modern day speedway rider today, they they're not doing the multidisciplined sports. So all right, some of them not a very talented and uh, very good motorcyclists who do come from a motocross background as well. So they can ride bikes, but I think the mixture, um, you know, a weekend on a grass track bike or long track bike, midweek in the speed, on, on the speedway, I think that kept, kept you alert and, and uh, on top of your game. And I think it's definitely a help for me. And I know it was for Simon and, and probably if he asked Kelvin, he would probably say the same. Yeah, absolutely, and it just broadens your experience as well, doesn't it? Across the whole sport, and there's 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 different things you can take from each discipline, I suppose that that, that helps you out overall. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you look, I mean, if you look at Cardiff, um, that famous Tony Ricardson when he sort of just rode the boards, didn't he, and mm. sort of rode the burn, and it was like his wheels were just uh, absolutely straight. He just parked it like a road racer and a you know rode the berm sort of road raced it half road race half motocross and just you know and just put it in there and actually lent it round which is which is you know multi-talented yeah the only person yeah. i've seen do something similar was greg hancock and i guess he's a sort of rider who's got that skill set as well have been able to yeah, pull that kind of move off. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That comes up. Yeah, similar sort of rider up over the front type. Or um, the only other guy I've seen him do that is seen seen him do that is George Hack, and that is in um, in Marmon. But he his two wheeling was uh, about uh, you know two and a half foot along the fence, <laughs> and then <laughs> fell off the fence. And <laughs> That's taken a bit too far. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't crash. <laughs> and moderate it somewhere. Yeah, um, and he passed he passed me and Peter Collins while he's doing it. We couldn't believe it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking around thinking, what has happened? <laughs> yeah, well, that's, we, we both, yeah, we did. Yeah, and the race was stopped. And I think um, Smudge Andy Smith was riding in it. And I think he ended up, in a ditch on the inside somewhere. <laughs> and we just chatted and I said, is it my eyes or did I just see something? And he said, and he said, well, no, that was George. And I thought, and, and, and we looked at the fence and, and it was, it's about a good to turn off foot up the fence, his rear tire, you know, a front and rear, you know, he's gone the whole wall of death, you know, <laughs> living the dream yeah um, I want to talk to you about um, Reading before we move on because um, uh, again a very successful um, part of your career and, and a, a team that you did very well with and particularly 1990 and 1992 winning the league championship must be um, part of your your career highlights um, being involved in that team and, and being the captain as well I, I believe in, in that uh, Reading team Yes, I was. I was very proud to be captain of, um, you know, but, but all the successes really, and and like I say, I was captain. But we were we're all we're all captains in our own right, you know, and that's why it worked. I mean, um, um, and it's not often you get um, you, you gel um, with the guys, and and uh, and when it does, you know, you. you, you as you just take you can you just take on the world and we did and um and we had tremendous success and i thoroughly enjoyed it um and also pat bliss and bill door i mean um they led from the top as well i mean they were um a, a lot of it they looked after us very well um a lot of the the deals we did were was just a handshake 
and uh, which is old school deals and um, uh, true to the word. So I mean that that kind of sets the precedence and um, and uh, mutual respect for everyone. And uh, and I like to think probably when you look at um, some of the riders in in the team, obviously Per. I mean, it, you know, he's very tragic his uh, accident he had. Um, but if you look at Tony Olsen, Amanda Castagna, uh, how they their input in the sport since since their Reading days, you, you kind of wonder. Well, you know, they're uh, yeah, very intelligent, very very intelligent people. Very intelligent Tony riders. Olsen and Armando Castagna, and of course Phil Morris is involved in that team as well. So you've got the full oh, FIM yeah. complement. Well, yeah, or, 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 and you, you kind of wonder. You, it makes you think. Well. Was it uh, was it a coincidence or was it um, it, it was because uh, we started something and and it evolved from there, which is uh, I don't know, but uh, it doesn't. It, yeah. Yeah, well, I did the interview with with Phil Morris last summer, and and he did allude to the fact that Armando kind of took him under his wing at Reading and um, and has done so at the FIM as well. So it's uh, very much a very much a Reading loving at the uh, the top echelons of the GP. Yeah, yeah, it, it has to be, you know, and um, pro- probably if I wasn't doing what I was doing job wise, I probably would be, you know, uh, you know, uh, probably another one as well. But um, obviously, I had to go a different path, um, work wise, and that sort of kept us kept us away from. Um, I kept obviously kept involvement in it in Ipswich, but that's probably as limits as much as I could do. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's fascinating, and it, uh, I think it, it shows what a good team can do as well. And 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 it's the right thing, isn't it? If you if you know people that are, are going to be good at the job, then why not um, why not get them involved? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I mean even um, look, guys like Dave Mallet. I mean, he he um, all right, he, he he was struggling a little bit, but we all rallied round and sort of said, "Well, have a go on this one, have a go on that," and 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 we we. All of us were just saying, well, try my engine, try that one, try that one, until he found something he, he said, God, I like this. And he, he was um, just as good as anyone. You, you know, he, 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 could, he, could be, he could be any number one mm. <laughs> round, round Reading. He's incredible. And uh, it just seemed any, anyone who um, was part of that team just got dragged along with it, really, without without um, putting pressure on anyone. And, and that's because we we all talked as well. You know, we all um, talked with each other and we all, um, well, we're all perfectly open. We all helped each other as well. And which is, uh, and that was, um, doesn't happen very often. Doesn't even happen in the workplace <laughs> very often. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it is, the, it is the, 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 the key, I think, you know, communication, helping each other out and, um, and, and working as one unit rather than a bunch of individuals. That's you hit the nail on the head, absolutely. We're going to do your Fantasy Speedway meeting very soon in our Speedway Paradise feature before we finished, uh, Jeremy. But um, first of all, a couple of questions. I opened it up before we were recording this. I said uh, if anybody had any questions for Jeremy Doncaster uh, to let us know. Here's a few of them. Um, kicking off with Gary Schofield, who has a question about your favourite sort of track, and I think we've probably alluded to the answer, but he says, would you prefer the tight technical track, like, say, Wolves, or somewhere a bit bigger like uh, like Bellevue? Which sort of track would you prefer to ride on? Well, they've both got their own challenges. Um, <clears throat> I'd say out of the two, uh, Bellevue or the technical track, I'd, I'd go for the Bell, Bellevue. I used to like the small technical Wolverhampton track, but... Um, on this occasion, I'd say, looking at the new Nationals track, I'd really like to have a go on that at some time. There's one here that says, uh, well, it's a photo, which obviously you can't see, but um, it's uh, a newspaper article, and the headline is, R- Racing Richard Meets His Biking Hero. And um, the message is from Richard Mower. This is me and Jen <laughs> in 1980. That's it. it. Says, can can you ask him if Winkle can have a golden helmet? <laughs> no, he can look at it. He's welcome <laughs> to have a look at it. <laughs> um, 
There's another Good one from boy. a, I think, a friend of yours, uh, Jay Ellis. I think this is Adam Ellis's dad, is it? From John Ellis. Um, do you remember us trying to buy a pizza before Lariol Grass Track and you paid with a fake $10 bill that had a naked lady instead of Abraham Lincoln in the middle? The pizza <laughs> owner loved it. I think it's still pinned to the wall there today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's too, too, the red wine's too too nice down that part of the world. I can, <clears throat> I can remember uh, <clears throat> every year I used to go to Marmonde and it's always Bastille Day. And it um, uh, just happened to be that... Um, Everyone was by the top, they were all waiting for us coming home, ready for this, the sort of the, the mass stock of red wine because he used to buy half the vineyard out, and they're all waiting for the for the alcohol for the for a barbecue. <laughs> when I got home, my dad <laughs> they used to turn up sort of late, all sort of knackered, and think they're going to help me up, unload the bikes and put them in the workshop, and they just unloaded the booze, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of import exports. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, excellent times. Yeah, well, exactly. it's, for, it's for personal use only. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the bike does run on alcohol. Honest. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's quality wine though down the south of France. In actual fact, I used to go on British Airways flights, and um, and they used to. Um, it wasn't until several years later because you could buy the stuff in the early eighties for fifty p a bottle, and 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 it's really quality, quality, quality wine, and and um, way ahead of it of its time. And um, it wasn't until about seven or eight years later, I was on a British Airways flight, and they served it with a meal on a. Well, they used to then. They used to give you a meal and a bottle of wine, a small bottle of wine, and yeah. it's Coke yeah. de Mamondes. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. yeah. So that, and you won't, you won't buy. You won't pay fifty p for one now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, certainly not on British Airways. Yeah, but that that place used to <clears throat> that's first rode out about nineteen seventy eight, I think it was, and or night at or very early, and that's just just a straw a uh, track with straw bales around it, and everyone huddled around a big oak tree to, for for some shade in the to get out the midday sun, and um, every year, if they made some money, they invested it into the stadium, and so. I've, I've, I've witnessed and watched uh, evolved into a, an absolute spectacle of, um, you know, under lights, grass track under lights with sort of six corners is, is something a, a bit special. If, if anyone, anyone wants to look, well, one of James's tours, he, he, he reintroduced it about four, four or five years ago. And, um, if you love your speedway and you want to see something a bit different, that's probably, Something you ought to probably um, go and you know put on your put on your list. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So Mom, so Mom, as you mentioned, Mom on's a, a, a different shape of track, isn't it? It's unique. Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's um, well, six corners really. <clears throat> yeah, or it's more more the first and second corner is a um, a corner with a with a straight in the middle of it. So you got um, so you go in the first corner. Clip the apex, run up to the fence, straight up, and then peel off the fence, and then clip the apex of the second corner going out, and then sort of rub shoulders along the along the fence going down the straight, and then you hit a big, well, a normal corner, a third and fourth corner is a big D-shaped, and um, yeah, you can sort of find the edge of the dirt, and, and that pulls you around nicely, and then yeah. you're back on the start and straight again. Yeah, there are a few sort of tracks that are slightly different. I think, mean, think to I've been to Sheffield quite a number of times, and Sheffield's the other way. Sheffield doesn't really have a back straight, does it? It's just kind of that is like a D shape when you look at it from above. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that is a um, bit of a trick track, Sheffield. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a funny one. I, I never really um, talked to it. I don't know why. I think because, probably because it is narrow and. Um, and I, I found myself following people. Do you, do you know what I mean? I, yeah, 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 yeah. 
it can be a funny one to get a hang of. It seems to be riders that have ridden for Sheffield that come back and do well. You, you very rarely find riders who have never ridden it doing particularly well on it, you know, mm. on, on their first go, if you know what I mean. It's one of those that you've got to learn the learn sort of to the, ride it. the trick of it, yeah. yeah. Learn the lines, yeah. Yeah, it is a bit of a trick, yeah. I can remember going down the British Open with Kai Neme and I was so poor. Um, one of the exit supporters travelled up then and said, you are absolute crap, diabolical. I actually gave the money back. Because <laughs> 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 we were rubbish. <laughs> Felt so sorry for us. So there yeah, is your money back. <laughs> oh, well. It's, 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 she it's, did laugh. It's, it's, it's as much as you can do, I suppose, isn't it? I mean, what else can you say? <laughs> That's right, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's rubbish. Here's your money back. There you go. <laughs> Some days it just doesn't happen. No, no, you have bad days at the office, don't you? You know, it doesn't... Um, I mean, if we were... <clears throat> if we could do it, turn it on all the time, all the time, then, well, that'd be great, but no, nobody can. But um, just proves you are a human and not a machine. Yeah. Always thought yeah. Hans was a machine, but he's he, he, he's had a few ups and downs as well. Hans Nielsen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's incredible. Um, you know, more or less like a machine, but uh, point scoring machine that was. But his wife didn't mind cleaning his levers. <laughs> I was going to say, there wasn't much to do, was there? <laughs> not not often really, they no. They really, really rarely saw Hans Nielsen caked in it. No, I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, she had an easy time, I think. <laughs> <laughs> This is Humans of Speedway. I'm Ian Brannan. My guest in this episode is uh, a legend of, um, well, Ipswich, Kings Lynn and England as well. He is Jeremy Doncaster. And right now it's time for Jeremy to give us his Speedway paradise, his dream meeting. Who would ride in it and where would it be? What would it look like in general? He's going to answer a few questions and help us, uh, in our minds, at least dream what Jeremy's meeting would look like in his ideal world. So, uh, Jeremy, first up, the first question will be... uh, as always in this little feature, is which track would you choose to race on? Irrespective of all of the facilities that the stadium might have, but the, the shape and the shale, the track that you would choose for your dream meeting, what would it be? It doesn't exist anymore. But um, I'll say we touched on the shale at Halifax, but I think probably uh, at the time, the best track to race on was the old Hyde Road at Bellevue. So that's yeah. my track. It's a big, uh, a big old uh, space. That it's a bit like Halifax, I suppose, but but wider. Well, the fit, the fit thing is that 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 place uh, on the third and fourth corner. I mean, used to, I used to watch PC round there a lot, and and by, just by watching it, I learned how to ride the place. And um, you could make a straight in the middle of the corner on the uh, third and fourth bend. And so, if you're coming in into that corner last you can still make it first to the run of the line, you know. So um, in some respects, it is easier to be behind so you could uh, make your uh, move on the last corner rather than being in front, not knowing where the other three riders are for four laps. So All right. uh, that's pretty unique. Good to have the <laughs> the opposition in front so you know where they are. <laughs> where they are, because you know you can make your move whenever you wanted to. Yeah, well, you certainly seem to be a fan of the, the, the bigger circuits than the tighter ones, perhaps. Would that be fair to say? I'd, well, well, not really. I, I mean, I, I used to love Wimbledon. Um, had, uh, lovely little place to ride, lovely little trick track. I, Wolverhampton early on, before they changed it, I liked that, that track. Always score round, round, well round it, although pe- people didn't like it because it was narrow, but I never, it never really appeared narrow to me. Um, it's much, much wider now. It's nearly two and a half times the width that it used to be today. Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously, um, Reading, we, we used to joke about the Reading ski jump as he went into the across the start and into the third corner, but... Uh, there's a track that went across that got, uh, during the season that um, it, it built up more and more as the season went on. So he had a little jump just as he went into the third corner. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so Hyde Road then. And, and if we're going to put that in a, a stadium, any stadium you like, uh, and the surroundings, where would we be putting a Hyde Road? 
Well, I reckon if you put it, um, I, mean, I, I, I can't really say Cardiff because I, although I've watched there, I've, I've, I, I think probably the traditional speedway track has to be outdoors, I think. So um, I would say on the, con there's a, on the continent, uh, there's a lovely stadium called um, in Pardubitz, which is in Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And that yeah. under lights um, with the track of Hyde Road uh, for a t traditional stadium where it holds a lot of people. And um, I think that's your, that's your, um, that's your stadium. Your perfect yeah. mix. And, and part of it is where you won the, the golden helmet, of course. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of them. Yeah, I did. Uh, back to back. One when it was, one when it was a communist country in the next year when it was, um, um, democratic. On to the big question then of your dream one to seven, any rider, alive or not and no points limits or anything like that so uh, who would be in your ideal one to seven well as it is unfortunately I, was, I did write jot them down on a notepad and <laughs> um because my memory's not that great nowadays <laughs> it's probably all a few knocks on the head i've had but um the first two are unfortunately no longer with us but i'd have um billy at number one uh billy sanders Okay. Yeah. Uh, number two, Simon Wig. Yeah, Simon Wig has had uh, a number of of nominations for um, for for an, for many um, people that have been guests on 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 this podcast. I mean, he was I remember him from Bradford, but obviously he was uh, a big rider for for Oxford and and a number of others, wasn't he? But um, he's got a lot of a lot of love and respect for Simon Wig, a hugely successful rider. But I think. The stories come across that he was a, a nice guy as well. Yeah, he was. I mean, I, mean, I did a lot of trips with him. Um, you know, and he's um, in the Wiggy bus. You know, as as we were, and we chaired a. I had a a, a van in Germany once, and um, we used to fly over on a Sunday morning, and uh, we just used to split the expenses um, going to the meetings, and that that worked out quite well for for a couple of seasons. Um, so yeah, we we spent hours together chatting about the sport and how, how, how it can be improved and and uh, so all those what you see now with the race suit and the team suits I mean that was um, Wiggy's idea his blueprint he sent to Terry Russell and um, and uh, yeah, 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 yeah I don't know what he would be doing now I, I would imagine he probably would be involved in the sport um, without a doubt, and I think he probably uh, um, would have a, a, a lot of input. Um, hell of a character, yeah. and a good, very good yeah. long track rider, and equally very good speedway rider. A bit vulnerable on the speedway sometimes. Um, used to take on a lot. Uh, you know, used to take on too many things all at once. Sometimes that used to. Um, get on top of his mind, you know, at the meeting sometimes, uh, you know, if it, you know, if he just sort of um, tried a bit too hard sometimes on the media type of things, if he, you can't do it all, you can do it, but not all the time, all of the time, if you know what I mean. It was very good with um, a, 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 a facet of sport that that's probably wasn't, um, looked at overly at the time probably ahead of his game in in like branding and and marketing and you know how he looked yeah. all the time he was it was always yeah. well everything was always pristine well presented and you know all that kind of thing with the the green mm. uh, you know you knew you, you knew who Simon Wigg was, was on the track without yeah. you know without having to look him up you, you knew straight away today it's part of the job you, you know if you if you want to be successful you've got your base yourself what Simon was doing and how he's presenting himself and portraying himself but um, at the time that was a tough job you know um, to, to, to perform and um, do the media uh, you know all that to, uh, with it at the same time mm -hmm. yeah well you'd have someone at least helping you do it anyway today <laughs> yeah yeah I'm sure. especially now there's even more stuff to do now than there was then 
Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Billy Sanders and yeah. Simon Wig. Yeah, then we've got um, Ivan Major. Oh, yeah, that's another one who's sadly no longer with us. Yeah, well, I needs a little it. introduction, but um, uh, an amazing, an amazing role. Yeah, he used, yeah, he was. Yeah, he used to do a lot of Ivan's tours in the, you know, in the in the winter time, um, America and New Zealand and Australia, and the long tracks. Then we've got uh, Peter Collins, the old mate PC. Yeah, how how is he getting on? Do you know at the, at the moment? Well, I think he's, um, I'm not sure if he's, he normally goes to Australia this time of the year, but um, uh, I don't know if he's gone this year or not. I don't know if he, if, yeah, I don't, 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 don't know how they've avoided COVID or not. I'm not. Yeah, I think, you, I think you can get to Australia, but it's not very easy and you've got to quarantine for quite a while, but I think it is possible. Mm. So. I think there's probably less of it over there than certainly over here anyway. But. Yeah. <laughs> I would hope that's the case. It's, uh, yeah, I think we've uh, we've certainly um, we're certainly leading the world in the amount of COVID cases, uh, apart from Russia, apparently, who are uh, who are firmly in the lead. Anyway, right. Right. so right. Peter Collins. Got, yeah, then we got um, we got to get to the modern day riders now. Then we got uh, Jason Crump. Yes. Yeah. Now Jason yeah. Crump's a big fan of yours, isn't he? He's he rode my farewell. Yeah, he's uh, yeah. Yeah. and. Uh, I took Jason to his first uh, continental meeting, actually. So, uh, yeah, oh, we go yeah. back a long oh, way. So it's a lot of good memories for Jason. Uh, and then we've got Chris, Chris Louis, who's, um, you know, part family. And Mark Lorem. Yeah. Yeah. And that, uh, oh, that's seven, isn't it? That's seven. seven. What about a reserve? Go on there, yeah, an extra one. Number eight, um, number eight, Amanda Castagna. Uh, <laughs> just to keep the FIM happy. Yeah, there, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've just had, a, I've just had a, a put them on, on Twitter that I was going to be talking to you, and and while we've been speaking, I've had a like from Paco Castagna. So maybe words getting back to the big man. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lo- lovely family, all of them. You know, the, his brothers. Uh, oh, superb! The whole whole family, yeah, they're oh, really, really good. good. Um, and Mariano, oh, they're great, yeah, yeah. Well, my, my most brother Paolo used to ride, and Mariano, in actual fact, I borrowed Mariano's bike in for the Golden Gala once in a ten ten year in Italy, and and he's packing up, and his bike was up for sale, and he couldn't sell it, and, and mine was playing up, so. I, Borrowed his for the final, won the final, and he sold it for twice the money. So his chapters. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. Increasing the value. It did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for your meeting then with all these stars, who would be the referee? Did you ever have a one that you preferred to uh, to be looking after yeah. the meetings you were involved in? Yeah, it's got to be Graham Brody. You know, the wing commander. He's, um, I can remember having a, a, a he was refereeing a meeting at Hackney once and um, uh, it was Ipswich v Hackney and Andy Galvin was the number one and I was riding for Ipswich and um, um, typical thing, first first heat uh, Andy ended up on his arse and you know first first turn bunching so it's uh, called back and Simo was a team manager and I knew Simo really well well as well and, and I could see him talking to him and, he's, and, and, and I, I could lip read him and he's saying don't let him get you know drop it on him you know get get over on the on the front of him and I knew exactly what he's going to try and do so anyway started again um, and I wasn't having any of it so and he you know ended up on the deck again so <laughs> Graham got us both on the I think there might have been three reruns and then graham got us both on the phone and and i explained the situation to him i said well it's it's simo you know um telling andy to drop drop his shoulder on me to stop us going in the first corner so then he had a word with andy and said look he said if if you don't the pair of you don't get around the first and second corner i'm just going to Put you both out. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we did. I think it was a four for ten, third or four for ten, anyway. But, but very fair, very fair referee. There's not many for referees who would 
have a conversation like that. <laughs> yeah, we'll give you give you give you fair warning of uh, you know, and three yeah. chances to have a go at it. That's yeah. it, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and while we're on that subject, actually, speaking of starts, it's something I haven't asked you about. You are probably known for your starts. Um, as as being as any of, as much as any of your skills really, but you've always been a a fast starter out of out of the gate. Is there a particular technique that that you use, or were you just naturally um, lightning reflexes? Or no, that? I think that there is a technique, and I've tried to teach people, and I've tried to explain it to them, and 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 I don't think there is anyone who starts the same. You know, it's um, it it's it is fairly um fairly unique i guess but um maybe maybe some of the guys in the 70s were started like that maybe ollie did because he used to slip the clutch I used, and that's basically what i do slip the clutch off the start so um um and don't start with sort of like thirteen thousand rpm i start mm. very very not a lot of motor and just sort of, uh, you know, just ride the clutch to the corner. And sort of accelerate uh, into the bend a little bit, is that? Yeah. Rather than yeah, sort of a full drop. Yeah, that's right. A bit more control. You've got more more chance of um, controlling your wheel spin and you can, you've got a better chance of moving your weight if it does start to, to claw up. Yeah, it's simple science, isn't it? It's just it's just balance and weight, really, for uh, for a speedway bike to 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 make it work. But it, it sort of evades some people, perhaps. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I mean, that's it, it, just obviously I've described it in like you know simpler terms as I can, which sounds very straightforward. But it is basically straightforward. But it's if if it's an unnatural thing to do, it's very difficult to actually to do it. You know, um, to 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 teach it, because um, naturally, if someone's revving a bike alongside you, you give it more revs, and and you've got to ignore everything you sort of what's going on next to you, and just concentrate and listen to what your motor's doing. Yeah, we're hard to tune into, and when you've got three other bikes at the side of you kicking out some well, and vibrations as well. Yeah, it's a vibration and noise and the nerves. You know, it's very easy to sort of just give it a little twerk. You can easily put on 10,000 revs without really trying very hard at all. Yeah. 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 Um, so that's the referee anyway. And the if you could change a rule of Speedway to, Im- to improve it for the betterment, if we could go straight to Armando Castagna's door, uh, what, what might that be? I think it's got to be the... Uh, uh, recently, the anticipation of the starts. I, th- I think because probably I, I know I said it, I'd slip the clutch and ride it to the corner. I always used to anticipate the starts as well. I used to watch the referee and count in my head and have a time in and have a feel for when they're going to um, hit the tapes. Um, particularly r- racing on the continent, you had to predict. Um, you could actually charge the tapes and referee would panic and, and push the push the tapes up. And and I think um, if I was riding today, I'd probably get put out of more times of races than I've actually get to the corner. <laughs> 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 so yeah, I, I was a lightning starter, but I'd say I, I probably used to, yeah, thinking of it, I probably used to predict the starts. Um, which, yeah. which I think I think if you can if you can get away with it, if you touch tapes right, you you. you blown it you know but if you if you can make um if you can uh predict it and uh, uh then and and you can you can get away with it fair fair play you know you've you've earned you've you, you've done your job yeah it's a point that's been made a few times actually i think phil morris um was was one of the strongest on this um saying that that he's done a lot of research and the, the the amount of time between the green light going on and the tapes going up has, has got shorter over the years. Uh, and now it's it's a lot easier for the riders to, to sort of guess and maybe the, the, the tapes should be held longer yeah. or they should be put on a timer so it's taken out of the, uh, you know, a randomizer so the referee presses a button and you don't, there's a de- perhaps a delay before the tapes go up so it's harder for the, the riders to guess. Um, I'm, I'm, that was just what I, he was I, saying. I think they did, 
have them on a timer once. I mean, you could easily do that actually. Just sort of hit 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 the button and it randomly uh, does a short or a long one. It probably frustrate the rides to to to, you know, to help. Mm. But um, certainly um, with the tape going up quicker, if it is if they're going up within two seconds, you know you can sort of you know it's very it's very unusual that they're going to go up on the first second, but there's a good chance that if you after if you count one and then start to sort of think about dropping the clutch, you could probably get it before they go up after before two seconds. You yeah. see what I'm saying? And if you if your wheel's far enough behind, you're probably not going to touch the tapes anyway. If 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 you know if they were going to go up around, then so you don't have to be bang on, but you might benefit from it. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So there's a couple of changes um, you could do, um, but de- basically the starting the starts and the starting technique. You know the <coughs> Excuse me, where the line is, and um, um, and probably probably go back to a longer pause. I mean, you shouldn't shouldn't be doing thirteen RPM at the start anyway. I mean, it's sort of the, the engine tuners are rubbing their hands together, or yeah, you know, or pulling the hair out. It's <laughs> a very good point. Um, the stage set then for your dream meeting, Jeremy Doncaster. We've got your all-time one to seven. It's going to be on the Hyde Road track uh, in Pardubice Stadium in the Czech Republic. Um, but who is going to be the opposition? Now, a team that you rode in, that Reading team of um, of 92, has, has been said to be the ultimate opposition a couple of times. Uh, which opposition are you going to go for in yours? It gave it a lot of thought, and I thought, well... And that kept coming to Reading, back to Reading. I mean, there's been some very strong Ipswich sides, <clears throat> and uh, and I, I think yeah, Reading '92 side against that side. I think that would be um, that would be a real good meeting, good match. And and Armando Castagna would definitely get a ride then. I'd put them in, yes. Well, I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd have to, wouldn't I? <laughs> I could yeah. actually have a. Uh, uh, because I've got several deceased riders, I could actually have an eight and a nine. Can I? And a, could have Dennis Segalas as a, you know, a, a, a second reserve. Can I? Yeah. Well, he's he's always an entertainer. Yeah. Yeah. Or John Cook as well. So, well, I've got three deceased, so I could have, you know, <laughs> Siggy and <laughs> with Mondo, Siggy and Cookie. That that would uh, substitutes as well. So I think that'd be quite good. It sounds like a good meeting. I think you'll certainly sell some tickets. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Trying to get them to ride. We might have had a few seances. To... <laughs> <laughs> it's possibly so. Uh, Jeremy Doncaster, it's been fantastic speaking with you. Thanks very much for sharing some of those great stories with us. I'm sure that um, people will have found it as fascinating as I have. More than welcome. More than welcome. There's a load more, but I'll I'll just bore you in the end. (laughs) (laughs) Are there any good ones that we haven't asked? They they come out ever so randomly. Memories sort of, (laughs) they're they're there somewhere, but I don't know. Sometimes you just have to, I think think all the guys are the same. You sort of like, a few of you get together and then they're just, you get a little little snippet come out and then yeah. you know, have to tell that little story and you know it just flows from there. Kind of, it, it, it does it just follows on then <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it's been great and i say um that there has been quite a few people asking uh, i put a post on a little while ago about who should i speak to and you were suggested by quite a few so i'm, I'm sure that people will will enjoy hearing your tales um right stuff. over the uh, <laughs> over the over the time and um yeah been great speaking to you brilliant all right then Ian. okay thanks enjoy doing it thanks 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 very much my thanks to jeremy doncaster for joining us on this episode of humans of speedway and thank you to you as well for listening of course if you have enjoyed it please leave us a five star review and um, don't forget to subscribe as well so you get new episodes direct into your uh, podcast 
player of choice, whatever that might be. Um, you can also check out previous episodes too if you're one of our new subscribers. Don't forget there's loads for you to uh, have a look at. Uh, Kelvin Tatum was uh, an episode we did just before Christmas. You can also hear from Gary Havelock, um, Roy Clark, Phil Morris, uh, Nigel Pearson, Shane Parker, Neil Machin. There's um, all sorts of stuff on there and uh, plenty more to come as well. So do follow us on our social media channels as well. Uh, we are at Speedway Humans on Twitter and if you search for Humans of Speedway on Facebook and Instagram, if you're on either of those, uh, get regular posts there as well. And something new from Humans of Speedway, if you are an Amazon Alexa owner, uh, there's a new skill that you can get if you search for Speedway News and then if you ask your device, what's the latest Speedway News? I won't say the name because I don't want to trigger all of your smart speakers off if you're in earshot of them right now. Uh, then it should bring you an update. Just search for Speedway News in the skills, add it, activate it, and then there'll be updates every day as we go through the season. That's the plan. So get in there and uh, be an early adopter and see if it works and let us know what you think of that. In the meantime, take care, stay safe, and we'll be back soon with more Humans of Speedway. Speedway.